verse 9, the Bible says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Let's bow, please, for a word of prayer. Dear Father, we thank you this morning, Lord, uh, for the Lord's day. We thank you for this Sunday that we can gather together in the name of the Lord Jesus and just be together as brothers and sisters in Christ and sing your praises, give to your work, pray to you and talk to you and have you talk to us through your word. We just thank you for meeting with us here. I pray that by your Holy Spirit you'd open the heart of every person that's watching, listening, or in this place and that you'd open the lips of your servant to speak, and that, Lord, you might magnify yourself and glorify your Son. I pray that you would edify your people and save the lost. Well, thank you for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. In verse 9, Peter is inspired by the Holy Spirit and tells us what we are and why we are here as born-again Christians. It seems that our purpose and mission on planet Earth as born-again Christians has been obscured by many and forgotten by some. We are, in this verse, called a chosen generation. In His sovereignty, God chose when He would come to Earth as the Savior. It was His timing, and His timing is perfect. The generation, the word is genos, it means kind. And God chose this generation to be a different kind of generation. He chose this generation to be a special kind of generation, like none other before and none to follow. He said we are a royal priesthood. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, it says, But ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. We are a royal priesthood. The word royal is the word that's translated kingly. And we are to offer up spiritual sacrifices to God as Israel offered up physical sacrifices. We're called a peculiar people. Well, let's go to holy nation. We're called a holy nation, and that holy nation is hagios, means sacred, and ethnos means tribe. We're a sacred tribe. Now, I'm not going to call this a dogma doctrine or a theological thing, but it just kind of went to my little brain that God had 12 tribes in the Old Testament that made up the, made up the nation Israel. He's got one tribe in the New Testament, the church. We might be the 13th tribe, though don't quote me on that or write it in a book or anything, because I'm just saying. Get in trouble saying things like that sometimes. And then we are a peculiar people. That phrase, peculiar people, means unique possession. Listen, we are different, and we are to be different. We're a different nation. We are a different people. We are a different priesthood, and we should be different. We are called in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, where it says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be separate, saith the Lord. This generation has been chosen to be separate and different from all other people on earth. Separately, we're supposed to be separated spiritually as a royal priesthood. We should be separated morally as a holy nation. We should be separated physically as a peculiar people. This generation has been chosen to show forth the praises of him who hath called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. This generation has been chosen to glorify God by its unique works. And in order to do so, we are called to be, and we are required to be, here's the word, different. But most people don't like to be different. Peter goes on to tell us, in the rest of the book, 
that as citizens, we're to be a different kind of a citizen. As servants, we're supposed to be different kinds of servants. As masters, we're supposed to be different kinds of masters. As a husband, we're supposed to be a different kind of husband. As a wife, we're supposed to be a different kind of wife. As brethren, we're supposed to be different kind of brothers. As those who suffer, we are to suffer in a different way. As believers, we're supposed to be a different kind of believer. We're different than any other kind of generation. When God chose Israel, he called them to be different. And when he called the church, he called it to be different. Because God's people are always different from the rest of the world. It has always been so. It should always be. Israel was different in the world, and the church is to be different from the world. But it seems that today the church does not want to be different anymore. Well, let me clarify that. The modern church does not want to be different from the world. But it does want to be different from the church of the Scriptures, a separated church. Did you hear what I just said? The modern church doesn't want to be separate from the world, but it wants to be separated from the historical, scriptural, biblical church. I believe that we are involved, whether we want to be or not, in a cultural war. And my first point tonight is this. Corrupt cultures. Turn with me to Psalm chapter 14. We'll come back here later. But right now, I want you to go with me to Psalm chapter 14, corrupt cultures. Psalm 14, look at verse 1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Every human culture is corrupt. From the Incas to the English, every human culture that has ever existed has been and will continue to be corrupt. Why? Because every culture is made up of and developed by Humans with sinful natures. Romans 3.10 says there is none righteous, no, not one. Now, if there is no righteous people, then there can be no righteous culture. Amen? Romans 3.12, there is none that doeth good, no, not one. Romans 3.23, all have sinned. In Romans chapter 1, turn there with me, please. We're talking about corrupt cultures, that every human culture that has ever existed or ever will exist is corrupt by virtue of the sinful nature. Now in Romans chapter 1, God reveals several things about mankind. In verse 21 he says, Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became a vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. And so when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. Number two, look at verse 23. And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man into birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Next, look at verse 25. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Now look at verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. Man's culture was corrupt from the get-go. So much so that man had to destroy, or God had to destroy mankind with a flood. That was real early on, you know. And then after the flood, he had to disperse mankind and confound mankind's languages at the Tower of Babel. A culture is the product of human beings. Human beings are corrupt. Therefore, the culture they create will also be corrupt. I hear people say this. 
Um, sometimes missionaries say it, sometimes evangelists say it, sometimes preachers say it. They say this, well, that's just their culture. And so they like to say, well, that's their culture, and use their culture as an excuse. But my dear friend, culture can be corrupt. So just to say that's their culture doesn't mean it's okay. The first point this morning is what? Corrupt cultures. Now, I want you to go with me to point number two, and it's this. Compromise with culture. Compromise with culture. Throughout history, the people of God have drifted toward being corrupted by the surrounding culture. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, look at verse 1. Throughout history, the people of God have drifted toward being corrupted by the surrounding culture. 2 Timothy 4, verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come. When they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their hearts from the truth. And shall be turned unto fables. When we turn from the preaching of the word. As it is to men as they are. We're headed for the corruption of compromise. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Look at verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. We need the correction of the scripture to keep us from the corruption of the culture. Now, the Jews began to compromise with the cultures around them and became corrupt in their worship. That which the Jews had to deal with in their time was a pagan society. There were pagans all around them. And God had chosen a, a nation, and uh, Abraham, and he made a nation, and that was the Jewish nation, and he made them different. But they had to deal with pagan societies all around them. The nations around them worshipped false deities. And eventually the Jews themselves began worshipping false deities. Why? Because of the corruption of culture. In Genesis chapter 35 verse 2, Then Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you. Wow, that's Jacob's household. There were strange gods. In Deuteronomy, and the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, and this people will rise up and go a whoring after other gods of the strangers of the land, whither they go to be among them and will forsake me. So God said to Moses, he said, you know, they're going to go into that land and those cultures around them are going to corrupt them and they will follow those cultures in their worship and forsake me. God said that way back to Moses. First Samuel, and Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, If ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you. Samuel had to deal with it, didn't he? And then in 1 Kings it says this, Then did Solomon build an high place for Shemosh, the abomination of Moab, and the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And likewise did he for all his strange wives, which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their gods. Corrupted by the cultures around them. So much so that Israel began with groves and idols and ended up with human sacrifice. That's what references here. Molech, Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. Molech was a false god whose image they would offer human sacrifice to. Then 
The Jews adopted the very things God told them to destroy when they entered into the promised land. Exodus chapter 34, verse 13, God said to Israel, But ye shall destroy their altars, break their images, and cut down their groves. 1 Kings 14, 15, talking about the children of Israel. And they made their groves, provoking the Lord to anger. Verse 23, for they also built them high places and images and groves on every hill and under every green tree. God said, when you go into the land, I want you to destroy all that stuff. They went into the land and allowed the culture to co corrupt them so that they did the very things God told them to destroy. They went from groves and idols to human sacrifice in their compromise. Now hold on to your seats. We find the same trend to be true with the Catholic Church. As the Catholic Church moved into different human cultures, it was confronted with various superstitions and religions. Remember the Jews had to deal with the pagans. The Catholics had to deal with superstition and other religions. And in its effort... It compromised with those cultures in order to make Catholicism more palatable to the culture. I'm just going to help you with the rosary. Listen to this. This is by Patricia Diley, A History of Praying on Beads. Prayer beads originated with the Hindu faith. Using beads for devotions dates to the 8th century B.C. in the cult of Shiva. In India, sandstone sculptures, statues from the 185 B.C., show Hindus with prayer beads. The names of Hindu gods and prayers are repeated on string beads called mala, separated by larger or different colored beads. From Wikipedia, prayer beads are used by members of various religious traditions, such as Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianity, Islam, Sikhism, and the Baha'i faith, to mark the repetitions of prayers chants or devotions, such as the Rosary of the Blessed Virgin Mary in Catholicism and Dirk in Islam. So the Islamics do the same thing with beads as the Catholics do. From the History of the Rosary by Father William Saunders. The origins of the Rosary are sketchy at best. The use of prayer beads and the repeated resuscitation of prayers to aid in meditation stem from the earliest days of the church and has roots in pre-Christian times. So here is a Catholic priest telling us that the rosary has its roots in pre-Christian times. What does that mean? That means in false religion. That's exactly what it means. A history of praying on beads says this, often when religions sought converts, they allowed them to retain some of their pagan ways, ceremonial garb, heathen rituals and traditions in order to add to their numbers. This led to spiritual pollution. Now, did you notice that in all these descriptions of the rosary, going back to the Hindus and all the other false religions of the world, this phrase kept coming up, repetitive prayer. That's what the beads are all about, repetitive prayers. But Jesus said in Matthew 6, 7, But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. So what happened? The religious cultures influenced and compromised the Catholic Church. How about the lighting of candles for the dead? The early concept can be traced back to civilizations in the early 4th and 5th centuries. The Macedonians would light candles for up to 40 days after a death. They believed the flame was a way to ward off ghosts and demons that might harm the deceased soul. The Greeks and Romans had similar traditions and used candles or torches as a way to guide the dead on their final journey. Early pagan cultures in Europe and Asia buried their dead with unlit candles and lamps as a way to give them light in their next life. The Roman Catholic Church teaches that lighting candles for the dead in correlation with prayer prolongs and amplifies the prayer. 
and memorializes the deceased. I want to say something right here. Ain't no candle going to add no power to my prayer. A candle has no power to amplify a prayer. But that's what they teach. The teaching behind candles associated with praying for the dead is the Catholic doctrine of purgatory. The idea, the idea is that after death, some people exist in a state of misery between heaven and hell. Catholics believe that the prayers of people on earth can improve the lot of those in purgatory and speed up their journey toward heaven. Well, if you believe that, then no wonder you have, if a candle is going to add power to my prayer and I'm trying to pray people out of purgatory, I'm going to lighten me a pile of candles. I'm going to have the biggest candle you ever saw. Why? Because I want my prayers to be speeded up to get that person out of purgatory. The purgatory is an unbiblical doctrine. The belief that candles hasten our prayers journey to heaven, make our prayers more powerful or effective, or add anything to our prayers is superstitious. And so where did they get rosaries from the, from the cultures? Where did they get um, candles for the dead? From the pagan cultures, from the world religions around them. Let me, t let me give me one more. Ash Wednesday. <clears throat> The practice of putting ashes on one's forehead has been known from ancient times. In the Nordic pagan religion, placing ashes above one's brow was believed to ensure the protection of the Norse god Odin. This practice spread to Europe during the Vikings' conquest. This laying on of ashes by the Vikings and by the Nordics was done on Wednesday, the day named for Odin. Wednesday was called Odin's Day. Wow, isn't that surprising? The Norse practice, which has become known as Ash Wednesday, was itself drawn from the Vedic Indian religion. Ashes were believed to be the seed of An Agni, the Indian fire god. Ash Wednesday was a non-Christian origin and was accepted into the beliefs of the Catholic Church at the Council of Nicaea in 325 A.D. The Council also settled upon the 40-day fast period. Well, the 40-day fast period was part of the Macedonian false religions practice. But the Catholic Church in Nicaea, 325 A.D., adopted the 40-day fast period as a standard length to celebrate Lent. During this time period, Constantine's goal was to combine pagans and Christians into a peaceful unit within the Roman kingdom. Now, have you followed all that? And so the culture, which is corrupt, has corrupt religions and corrupt paganism and corrupt superstitions, and they compromised the Catholic Church. Because they would rather compromise and get more people in. See? So we find that trying to compromise with a culture leads to the corruption of faith. Now, we fast forward to modern Christian era. And we find that our culture war is not primarily with pagans. It's not even primarily with ancient world religions. Our culture war is with the religion of the 21st century, and the religion of the 21st century is secular humanism. The modern-day evangelical church in general, and, and some fundamental Bible-believing churches in specific, are willing to compromise with the culture in order, they say, to reach the culture. See, that's a good excuse, isn't it? But I have a sneaking suspicion it's not really about reaching the lost as it is building a big church. The modern church compromises with secular humanism in several ways. Number one, modern perverted translations of the Bible. You know what, you know what the enemy wants to do? He wants to destroy the Word of God. He wants to make it lose its power. How do you get the Bible to lose its power? You change it. 
And I want to put you to the test. If you don't believe it, you can, you can do your own study on this, but you can look at every single Bible translation on planet Earth and compare it with the King James Bible, and you'll find that serious changes take place. Even in the New King James Version, there are serious changes that deal with doctrine. Why? So it'll lose its power. So you see... My opinion, and I believe I can back this up with, with study and documentation, but every other version on planet Earth besides the King James Version is a corrupt version. But the modern churches, they don't care. Let's use the easiest one to read. I'll give you a comic book version of the Bible. That's the easiest one. And so when you go to some church, you, just, you, don't, you don't take your Bible, you take your comic book. We compromise with the culture by modern rock music and light shows and darkened sanctuaries and dancing. That's all cultural compromise and corruption. Modern dress standards that promote nakedness and accentuation. Getting rid of the cross. Getting rid of hymn books and old-fashioned spiritual songs. Casual dress in the pulpit. I'm thinking, I bet you I could get a big crowd if I get rid of this pulpit, put a nice big easy chair here. And I'll come in, I'll grow a mustache, and I'll come in and I'll be real casual. I might get one of those jackets with the things on the on the, on, on the elbow, a little turtleneck. And I'll just come in and I'll sit in my nice big easy chair with a pipe. And we'll just talk. Let's just pontificate together. We've compromised with the culture with positive thinking. And preaching that does not talk about sin or hell or judgment or accountability or obedience. Home Bible studies have now taken over the Sunday night service and the Wednesday night preaching time. We have a blending of culture and religion with an emphasis on feel good rather than sound doctrine. We have Christian tattoos, we have Christian rock, we have Christian punk. We have Christian grunge, and we have Christians with pink hair, and Christians with mohawks, and Christian piercing, and Christian drinking, and on and on and on we can go. And you're telling me that the culture hasn't compromised the church? It's compromised Christianity. I even read where a woman nightclub dancer, and she says she strips for Jesus. You say, well, I can't believe that. Look, folks, where's, the, where's it going to end? Right. You see, once you start going down that road, there's no stopping. There's no off-road. Churches today do not want to offend seekers. You hear that? They have a seeker-friendly church. We don't want to offend people who might be seeking. I've got news for you. Romans chapter 3, verse 11 says, There's none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. There's no such thing as seekers. Because sinners don't seek after God. You know what happens? The truth is that sinners do not seek after God, but God seeks after sinners. Jesus said, I came to seek and save that which was lost. And Jesus said this, And if I, if I be lifted up, from the earth will draw all men unto me. Do you understand how it works? Sinners aren't seeking for God. God's seeking for them. And when Christ is lifted up and Christ is preached, that's what he uses to draw men in. He doesn't use rock music to draw men in. He doesn't use fleshly standards to draw men in. He doesn't use all this stuff that's going on today to draw men in. He uses the gospel of Christ and lifting up Jesus. 
And you say, well, those churches have a lot of people. Well, you know what? I'd rather have a smaller church going to heaven than a great big church going to hell. I don't know about you. I'd like to have a bigger church going to heaven. Amen? We're living in a day and an age where Christianity has been compromised by the culture. What are sinners seeking when they attend compromised churches? I submit to you that they're not seeking biblical truth and the biblical Jesus, but a religious pep pill. That'll make them feel good. And when and if a person is being drawn by the Lord and they enter into such a church, what will they find? You know, I was, I was in a tire store and I was, t- I was in there getting some tires on my car years ago and there was this guy leaning on the counter. Big old guy. Big old hairy guy. I mean, he had long hair, big old burly old mustache. Had a do-rag t- around his head. Had leather everywhere, leather pants, leather coat, leather false teeth. I mean, he had leather everything. <laughs> And on top of that leather, he had bandanas. He had bandana tied around each bicep. He had a bandana tied around his knee. And he had chains hanging everywhere. He had chains in his pockets and chains on his wrists and chains in his nose. I mean, he had chains everywhere. I mean, the dude looked scary, you know. He's leaning against over there. I'm standing over here. And then the Holy Spirit said to me, why don't you tell him about Jesus? I said, what? <laughs> Oh, he said, why don't you tell him about Jesus? I said, let somebody else tell him about Jesus. <laughs> somebody will tell him about Jesus somewhere, someday, I'm sure. The Holy Spirit kept dealing with me, so I walked over to this guy, and I said, uh, how you doing? And he didn't say anything, he just looked over. <laughs> I felt like he was looking at me and wondering if he would, whether he should smush me or not. <laughs> like you do a bug, you know? And I said, well, uh, um, I'm Pastor Alquist from Grace Calvary Baptist Church. I, I, I'd like to invite you to church. I handed him a track and went like this. <laughs> I handed him that track. He took that track. He opened it up. He said, church, huh? I said, yeah. He said, I went to church once. I said, you did? Where'd you go to church? He said, I went up to that big church. If I said the name of it, everybody in here would know it. I said, I went up to that big church up there. I said, well, how was he? He said, I'll never go again. I said, why not? He said, I went into that church, and I sat down, and I felt like I was at a Pink Floyd concert. And he said, that ain't how church is supposed to be. And it just blew me away. I mean, I didn't know what to say. Here's the guy that you would think would look for that kind of church. That'd be exactly what he's looking for. But he said, when he wanted to go to church, you see, when he wanted to go to church, He wanted to go somewhere that was different than the Pink Floyd concert. Different than the club down the street. And when he went there, he was disappointed because all he got there was the same old stuff he could get anywhere. So he said, what's the use? I told him, I said, well, friend, I said, if you come to to my church, you won't have none of that. He never came. But I just wanted you to understand. Not everybody's looking for that jive. Compromise with the culture kills. My wife and I, for our 25th anniversary, we went went to Hawaii. And and we couldn't afford to go to to the big island, you know, where they got all the stuff. So we went to... The, the, this little in, uninhabited island just had one, one, uh, one road. It had one paved road on it. Didn't have a single stoplight on the whole island. and had one resort. We enjoyed ourselves. But we decided to go to church. On a Wednesday night, we could, there, was a, there were, was a couple Baptist churches on that island, believe it or not. We couldn't find a Baptist church that was open on Wednesday night. So I was talking with the preacher. I finally, on Sunday morning, we found a church. We went to that church. I don't want to tell you about it. But we went to the church. And uh, I said to him, I said, how come there's no uh, Wednesday night service? And he said, well, nobody will come. I said, what? He said, nobody will come. He said, well, that's just their culture. And I said to him, 
Well, they can't come if you don't have it. Right? Amen. See, my thought is, why don't you have one anyway? Why don't you have a Wednesday night service? Maybe one person will come, and then two, and then three. It might not be their culture, but it should be your culture as a preacher. Compromise with culture corrupts Christianity. And my last point is this. Changing the culture. True biblical Christianity was never meant to compromise with the culture, but rather to challenge and change the culture. In every nation where Christianity took a foothold, that nation rose to civility and character. In Psalm 33, 12, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. You look around the world and see which nations are the most blessed and see which ones are the most civilized. And then you look and see which ones are the most backward and which ones are the most um, crazy and dark. And then you come back and tell me what you found. And I know what you'll find. Every culture that was changed by Christianity went upward. The Word of God and the Lord Jesus Christ transcend culture. Biblical Christianity inf influences culture. Nowhere does the Bible ever hint at compromising with culture or catering to culture, but to challenging and changing the culture. Indeed, a Christianity is all about change. It makes new creatures. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Go back there to 2 Peter where we began. Christianity is all about change. It changes a man or a woman into a new creature in Christ. It creates new relationships. 2 Peter chapter 9, verse 10. I'm 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. <laughs> But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous night. Look here, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. You said, you know what? Christianity creates new creatures, and Christianity creates new relationships. Now you're a child of God. Christianity gives a new heart. Ezekiel 36, 26, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. It gives a new song, Psalm 40, verse 3, and he hath put a new song in my mouth. Even praise unto our God, many shall see it and fear and shall trust the Lord. It gives a new life. Romans chapter 6, verse 4. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. That's all different stuff. When God saves a man or a woman and makes that man or woman his very own and part of the holy nation and part of the royal priesthood and part of the particular uh, peculiar people, he changes that person from the inside out. He does not call on us to be like the world, but to be different, to be separate, to be holy. And if any church requires less, it betrays the Lord, it cheats God's people, and it deserts the lost it professes to care about. Are you following me? Yes. If all the church has to offer the lost is, and sinful world is a warmed up version of itself, then it has nothing to offer. The culture does not need more of itself. The culture needs something different. The culture needs something new, something different, something that has the power to change. This come as you are and leave as you came type church 
and preaching is not biblical New Testament truth. The modern evangelical church that does not have the power to change is willing to be changed. Did you hear what I just said? So you look around and you see the churches that have changed. You know why they've changed and become so much like the world? Because they don't have the power to change. Because they do not have the power of God. Because they are not preaching the word as it is to sinners as they are. And these kinds of churches are filled with Christians who do not want to change. We don't want to change. We're happy the way we are. Worldly, compromised, corrupt. God does not require you to change to get saved. But He will make a change when He saves you. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and we're almost done. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I want you to see this and we'll close. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, look at verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor adulterers, nor effeminate nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Here it is. And such were some of you. See the change? But you're washed. But you're sanctified. But you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Amen. The power to change. The culture war is real. The culture seeks to compromise the church, but the church has been called to change the culture. And to the extent that we do or don't, as, as Christianity, is visible in the culture around us. Let's bow for a word of prayer. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. Let me ask those of you who are Christians, you're born again Christians. Have you been hoodwinked into thinking that the church needs to be more like the culture around it? Have you mistakenly believed that in order to win the world, we have to become more like the world? And do you really believe that a blend of Christianity and corrupted culture will result in a better Christianity? Christianity broke on the scene like a storm and changed cultures all over the world. Being more like the culture won't make us better Christians. Maybe you're here today as a Christian. You need to determine to stand and having done all to stand. And if you're here today and you've never been saved, you've never been born again, truth is that unless you get saved from the penalty of your sin by trusting Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're going to die and you're going to spend eternity in hell. That's the plain, unvarnished truth. That's just the way it is. Now, you can do something about it or not. That's up to you. But Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And the Bible says, neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And the Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And the Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And the Bible says, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And then the Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Do you need to be saved today? Do you need to be born into God's family by grace through faith? You might be sitting here today and you're saying, preacher, I do not know for sure that if I died today I'd go to heaven. 
but I sure would like to have that assurance and I'd like to trust Christ as my Savior before it's eternally and tragically too late. If that's your desire, you can be saved right where you sit. You can receive Christ right there in your seat in the privacy of your own heart and mind if you want to. If that's what you want to do, look up at me. And don't look down until I see you face to face. And by looking up, you're saying, Preacher, I need to be saved and I, I, I'm willing to trust Christ right now. I need to do it and I don't want to pass, get the opportunity passed by. If you're looking up and I can't tell, then raise your hand. Anybody like that here today? Raise your hand up. Let me see it. Dear Heavenly Father, then I pray for all those in this room professing to be Christians. Father, I pray each one is. And I pray, my Father, you'd help us to realize that if we try to compromise Christianity with the culture, we'll only become more corrupt, not more Christian. Help us, my Father, in these last days to stand, and having done all to stand. Help us to reach out with something new, something different, the gospel of Christ. Let people see something new and something different, our lives as new creatures. Let them hear something new and something different from our lips, the love of the Lord through the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, help us. Guide us and direct us. Bless the invitation as only you can, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand, please. We're going to sing our closing hymn today. It's number 543, Jesus, I Come. Maybe you'd like to come this morning as a Christian. And just get before God and say, Lord, I see it. I see it. It's happened in history. And it's happening today. And I don't want to be part of it. Maybe you'd like to come and say, pray for your church and say, Lord, I don't want us to become a compromised and corrupt. I want us to stand. I want us to stick. And maybe today you need... You just need to come and pray about anything that might be on your heart and mind. Feel free to do so. If you need Christ as your Savior, you come and see me, all right? As we sing on the first. Out of my bondage, sorrow and night, Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come. Into thy freedom, gladness and light. Jesus, I come to thee. Out of my sickness, into thy health. Out of my want and into thy well. Out of my sin and into thyself, Jesus, I come to thee. Right, listen, we've got a big, big morning this morning. We've got a baptism, and then we got taken new members. So I hope you can hang around for a few extra minutes to do that. It's Sunday. Amen. It's the Lord's day, right? Well, let's give him all the time he wants, Amen. all the time he needs. We're going to sing the last stanza. Now listen, if you're here today and you've never been saved, you want to talk to somebody about it, you come and see me. If you're here today and you've been born again, you're saved and you know it, but you've never been scripturally baptized by immersion, you need to come and take care of that this morning. We've got everything we need except you. And if you haven't been scripturally baptized by immersion, then you haven't been scripturally baptized because the word baptized comes from the Greek baptizo, means to plunge, to dunk, to put under, to submerge, and it pictures the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And so if you haven't been scripturally baptized as a Christian, you need to do it. And you can do it today. All right? So if you have questions about salvation, you come. You want to be baptized, you come. You want to pray, you come on this last stanza. Out of the fear and dread of the tomb, Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come, into the joy and light of my home, Jesus, I come to thee. Out of the depths 
hopes of ruin untold into the peace of thy sheltering fold ever thy glorious face to behold jesus i come to all right, here's the order we're going to do this. We're going to baptize first. And it's a public baptism, so we need a public. And then we're going to take some folks in with the right hand of fellowship, so we need some right hands uh, to give the fellowship. All right? So I hope you can stay for that. And I'm going to ask Mark to pray. Close this portion of the service in prayer and then lead songs while we get ready. Thank you, Father God, for the truth that is preached here at Grace of Calvary Baptist Church, Father God. Father, we pray that you would protect this church from compromise, Father God. Lord, we see some of the compromises that are going on in the world. And so we could say, yay, amen, amen. But Father God, there's some compromises in our own lives. Each and every one of us can probably admit to ourselves that we've allowed the world to sneak in and make some changes in us. Father God, show us how holy you are and how much separation should be in our lives, Father God. Be with those that are here, watching, listening, that are lost, never come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. They might have a religion, Lord God, and they might think they're okay, but Father God, without recognizing their sinfulness and guilt before a holy God and that the remedy is the Lord Jesus Christ, they will die and spend an eternity in the fiery depths of hell. Father, I pray today that you would show them plainly that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. We'll thank you for this baptism and the members that are joining today, and we'll just give be the praise and glory in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. We'll uh, uh,